Good evening. We welcome you tonight to our midweek time of prayer and Bible study. Glad that you're with us. I hope that you have had a blessed week thus far. As you came in tonight, we had prayer list and a new outline. Does everybody have the prayer list and an outline for tonight? Anybody would like a prayer list or outline? I got somebody who can deliver them. All right. So a couple of announcements to make before we take up uh, take some prayer concerns tonight. One, next Wednesday night, I am calling a special called business meeting, and so that will be for the purpose of deciding on the air conditioning. So we have the quotes in and the the building and grounds. And finance committees met jointly yesterday uh, to talk, talk through the quotes that have been received. They've got recommendation to make to the church, and so that will happen next Wednesday night. All right, so next Wednesday, special called business meeting uh, to address. And there are two issues that will be addressed. Uh, it will be the uh, replacement of the units in for the sanctuary, uh, as well as... Uh, what, what, I, what we're gonna, what I'm calling, well, what is a, a computer uh, software issue for the system in, here in the Family Life Center um, that uh, that that needs to be done. It is a repair that needs to be made. Um, otherwise, the the there's already a unit that's not working because of that um, here in in this building. So we'll we'll be dealing with both of those issues next Wednesday, just as a friendly parliamentarian reminder, these are the only two things we will deal with next Wednesday, all right? Uh, those are the only two items. What items? Those two items. All right, those are the only items that we'll, that we'll be dealing with, uh, and, uh, and you'll, you'll have an opportunity to uh, hear from, from both the, the building and ground side as well as the financial side. And uh, you'll have opportunity to ask ask questions, and would encourage you to do so. So again, that's next uh, next Wednesday night. Also, a reminder about uh, two two items we've been talking about now for for a few weeks. Well, we're in the midst of the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, which we take up for our North American missionaries. So if you've not had an opportunity to give, would ask that you pray about giving. You can give any time uh, this month, and then leading up and including. Easter Sunday. That's usually when uh, when we take up this offering. Uh, and if you if you have a box of envelopes of giving envelopes, there's one marked in there for that. If not, and you would like to give, uh, you can just slip it in an envelope that you have and just mark it Annie Armstrong, and it will get designated to the right location. We also are looking forward to Vacation Bible School, June seventh through the tenth. Uh, there is a, there's a sign up just outside these doors, and you can see the various positions that uh, that we need and ways that you can serve. Uh, would also ask that you uh, you talk to Jane Ferguson if you have any questions. Uh, she can tell you more about it. Now, given the the circumstances with the the sanctuary and uh, the fact that we're voting next week on moving forward. Uh, then, then that that job will take the better part, if not the entirety, of a month. What I, what we mean by that is getting the units here. Those will have to be made. They'll have to be brought here. It'll only take probably a few days, three or four days, to actually put them in. So we are going to do Easter Sunday in the sanctuary uh, because we do have uh, air conditioning, and so that will we can make that work if we need it. So two events that are coming up. One next Sunday night, our Easter cantata, that will be in the sanctuary, as well as Easter Sunday. So Easter Sunday morning, we will also be in the sanctuary. Now, next, the, this coming Sunday morning, we'll be in here again, and, and that, is, that is primarily because there is, there is some 
element of uh, transition as far as equipment is concerned to get from here back into the sanctuary, stuff that came from the sanctuary to bring it in here so that things can be recorded and properly done. So that's going to need to be moved back, and that requires a little bit of effort, so we'll still be doing our service this Sunday morning in here. But Easter Sunday will be in the sanctuary. That means uh, it'll, it'll be live-streamed, and, uh, and so will the Easter cantata for next Sunday night. All right, so just make note of that change. Um, if you don't remember it, uh, then show up on Sunday and follow the people. All right, uh, you'll eventually get to the right the right spot. Uh, that is also a benefit because we definitely have more capability in the sanctuary for the two services to have a bit more room to spread out. If there are folks who would like to come for Easter, but they they are uncomfortable about what they might, you know, would be worried about if there's just one way in and out really coming in here. So, so you've got all the opportunities of coming in and out in the sanctuary that are better as well as having a little bit more space. So spread that word and, uh, and encourage folks to, to worship with us on Easter Sunday. It has been two years, all right? So let's worship together uh, on Easter Sunday. We'll look forward to that. All right, let's take our Bibles, turn to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, all right, quick show of hands, how many of you have an English translation of the Bible? English, English Okay, yes, not your question. I know you feel like it is. Again, it's reasonable. Sometimes I do trick you. All right, but no, this is, yeah, you all have, right? Everybody has an English translation. Anybody in here not have an English translation of the Bible that you're, you've brought with you? Non-English translation, all right, no, okay. So you all have an English translation. Do, do you feel like you know the English words that are in that Bible? Everybody? Like, in other words, for the most part, the words you come across, <laughs> they're, they're regular English words, right? I mean, maybe there's an exception. There, you know, you probably don't work in the word, um, you know, sanctification all that often in your day-to-day -day, um, verbiage, but the words that are in the text, I mean, that they're, they're English words, right? And, and you would recognize the structure of the sentences, right? That they... They, they, you can read it. Everybody here, you'd say, I'm not, we're not to the point of understanding, but would you say, yes, I can open up my Bible, and pastor, as long as you don't ask me to read Ezra chapter 2, yes, I could pronounce all the words that are in here, as long as there's not some weird geographical location or odd Hebrew name, you feel like, yes, I could read the Bible. All right. And in fact, um, even the most literal translation of the Bible, the English version, which generally is considered the New American Standard, uh, did, did you know even that one is written somewhere to a 7th or 8th grade level? And that would be considered the most complicated uh, of the translation. So, and anything else, probably a little bit lower. I have read that, that a lot of translators shoot for the 6th grade mark. That's what they're shooting for. All right, so... We've settled this, right? You've got an English Bible. There, there are actual English words in there. You recognize those words. If I were to pass a mic around, you'd be able to read out that passage. How many of you would say you understand the vast majority of the Bible? You understand that, you, that when it comes to the vast majority of everything that's in there, you got it down pat. All right. I mean, some of you may feel, yeah, some of you may feel like, yeah, you know, I've got a pretty good handle on the Bible, all right? Okay? Some of you, though, would say, well, no, you know what, the way you put it there, no, I can't say that, all right? We'll go even a little bit further. How many of you would say that when it comes to reading and studying the prophets, you've got it nailed? No problem. I understand. I don't need commentary. I don't need Hebrew. I don't even need the study notes at the bottom of the Bible. All right? I got it. I've got it nailed down. In fact, prophets are the easiest part of the Bible. Anybody? Yeah, probably not. 
Now, why, why do I bring all this up, especially in such a snarky way? One, it's Wednesday, all right? Just kind of the mood I can be in on Wednesday night sometimes. But I bring it up because it identifies what is a fundamental issue when it comes to how believers deal with the Bible. It's not so much an ability to read and even comprehend the words on the page. The fundamental issue, and maybe it would even be twofold, is interpretation and application, right? I mean, at the end of the day, that's it. Interpreting the words, in other words, studying it for what it is, being able to understand the words, the phrases, the grammar, and then beyond that, then understanding its theology, then beyond that, understanding why do I care? How, what, is, what is this doing for me? Why, why did God say this is his word? And why did he say it gives me life? And why does he say it makes me like Christ? You know, trying to not just read it, but to understand it, to interpret it rightly, and then be able to apply it. So this is the real challenge, right, when it comes to, to how we interact with the Bible. And I think a lot of believers would, would say, yeah, when it, when it comes to this issue, I can, I can read it. <laughs> I can read the words on the page. Uh, I mean, whether it's Romans or whether it's Psalms or whether it's Ezra, again, as long as it's not the names. All right, as long as it's, you know, something that, that the, the, yeah, I can stand. I'll read it in Sunday school. If you want me to read on Sunday, I can do that. Just don't ask me to explain it. And part, parts of it can be, can be challenging. Now, that's not true for every single part, but I think we'd recognize this is the challenge of dealing with the Bible. And I would suggest nowhere is this more prominent than when it comes to the prophecies, prophetic parts of the Bible. In fact, I would guess that most believers would say those seem to be the strangest and, and, and the least accessible parts of the Bible. Well, when we start talking about how do we understand, how do we interpret the prophets, how do we apply the prophets, well, this, this really just becomes, this becomes a challenge for us. So tonight, I'm doing something a little bit different. I mentioned this last week, and we're going to use Joel chapter 2, we're, we're going to it's still going to be in the context of Joel, but it's kind of getting us ready for the rest of our study in Joel, and what I'm going to do tonight I hope will be beneficial for the rest of the minor prophets that we will study. I felt like it would, given where we were in Joel chapter 2, where we finished, I think we're at a good part where I would like to provide some further instruction on how you can better understand and apply the prophets, to give you what I hope will be maybe some questions to ask, uh, maybe give you some tools to help you better evaluate the passage that is in front of you. Now, granted, what I'm going to tell you, does it's not going to make you an expert in this uh, because I'm not an expert in all of this. I mean, I, I know I talk like it, but I still require commentators. I I require real experts in the Hebrew language. I mean, I, I, I've got some familiarity and understanding with all of that, but nonetheless, I run across stuff in here that I go, hmm, that's a head scratcher. Oh, wow, what does that mean? And, and then I've got an added problem because then I've got to convince 65 of you that it matters as well, right? I mean, the average number is coming on Wednesday night. So uh, it, this, it, this isn't going to make you an an expert necessarily. However, I think what I'm going to share tonight is going to provide you some, some further direction on how, how you can better read and then understand and then apply, in particular, the prophetic material. Now, we got to a little bit of this last week, if you recall. In fact, if we're going to the first slide, I think this is on your notes. So you'll note the notes look a little bit different tonight. Um, and we don't have one passage that we're studying. But I even mentioned this last week. Last week we, were, we finished up Joel chapter 2, verses 21 through 27. Looking at this portion where God had promised to, to the Jews this great restoration coming off of the heels of what, have, what had been a devastating judgment of God. The people had prayed, they had repented, they had fasted, they'd sought after God, and there's every evidence and reason to believe that what happened, God heard their prayers. 
The folks of Judah did what 2 Chronicles seven fourteen says to do. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and confess their sin and repent and turn from their wicked ways, then, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. I think that's exactly what that passage is saying. It's exactly what God did because that's exactly what the people did. So we spent time working through that and we ended last week by looking at the issue of application. How does this apply? How do we move then from interpretation to application and and discern why a passage like this would mean something to us? An important way you study the Bible is discerning these points of application. So reading and studying prophetic material, I think one way you can begin to discern its application, and this is what I mentioned last week, so this is still just a bit of picking up where we left off, to ask and, and, and try and answer two questions. By the way, these two questions what would help you at any point of the Bible, but in particular, I, I find them helpful uh, as it pertains to prophetic material, and that is, what does this say about God and how he relates to people? What does the passage say about God and how God relates to people. Now, you could even break that out a little more specifically, how God relates to his people, pagan people, and his rebellious people, right? You could, so you could even break out people into kind of those, those three care, categories, like his, how do, does this telling me something about how God's gonna relate to his people when they're faithful, when they're rebellious, Or is it telling me something about Gentiles? Is is this passage talking about how God's relating to those, whether it's Old Testament prophecy, right, relating to those outside of the covenant family? Or how's this passage, you know, how does God relate then to unbelievers? So what does it tell me about God and how God relates to people? And then what I would call the flip side of that. What does this say about people and how we should relate to God? Really, I think you do yourself well, even, as you're re- even if you're doing something like reading through the Bible in a year, I think you do yourself well to have these two questions on at wherever you read, all right, that you would keep these in mind because you're going to go a long way, I think, in extracting information and then application out of a passage by asking these questions. Because when, when I ask the question, what, you know, um, how, what does this tell me about God and how he relates to his people, I mean, that begins to speak then to my own actions and, and, and expectations. And then for sure, number two then comes around and gets that same kind of issue from the other direction. So asking these questions, I think, are helpful and important. All right, so that's, we mentioned that last week. But here's where prophetic material really gets sticky, Because not only is there this application we're seeking where we're asking personally, all right, why why should I personally care about Joel chapter two? Why why should I care about these promises that seem to be made to a people who lived in in 800 BC? So that's already a challenge to try and figure out how, how does this speak to me? But then we've got this other sticky element of prophecy, and that is when prophetic material is pointing to events in the future. And it gets even trickier when it seems like there are, there are parts of a passage where it has partial fulfillment, and then it seems like, well, maybe that's talking about stuff that's even coming up in the New Testament. And then there's stuff where you think, well, you know what? It doesn't seem like that's happened at all. So it seems like maybe this is happening all the way at the end of time. So how, how, how are we to work our way through that? That really makes this material difficult uh, to, to access. So uh, how do we think about prophecy? What, what are some ways that we can think a little more carefully Uh, about the prophetic material. So this is what we're going to do with with at least a few minutes, and then we'll finish it up next week. Because next week is a special called business meeting where we can only deal with two items of business, right? Right. All right. So what I want to do tonight then is, is consider this, and then we'll finish it up next week. When reading portions of Scripture that prophesy future events, we need to understand that there are partial fulfillments. 
where not every detail is being realized and instead points to future fulfillments to come. And in fact, may point to elements beyond the time of the book that's been written, but they are somewhat fulfilled in the New Testament, but then pointing even beyond that to what we call the end times. So how, 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 do, we, how do we as just everyday readers of the Bible, because again, I, I understand, you know, when, when, you, when you would say, well, pastor, it's easy enough for you to talk about this. This is what you do every day. So, how, 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 do, how do I, uh, as you know, somebody who's trying to read and study the Bible, and I, and I don't have a seminary degree, and I don't spend hours every day doing nothing but studying the Bible, uh, what, how can I access this material easier? What are some ways I could, I could understand this better? I'm going to give you three categories, three categories for understanding how prophecy is applied. And I mean applied beyond just those, the personal application questions we talked about, some of the applications we talked about last week. I mean, how, what, what are the categories that will help me understand the way this applies in terms of the prophetic material? Do you know what? It may be helpful for me to even make this clarification just because, now this is going to sound weird, all right? Just because somebody is a prophet doesn't mean he's giving prophecies. What? I know, it sounds weird, just, but that's the best way I could think to say it. Just because somebody's a prophet doesn't mean he's giving prophecies. I'll give you one famous example. Jonah. You do know nothing Jonah said ever happened. Right? All right? So, but, but, so what was his job? Was his job to foretell future events? No. All right. So the reason I bring this up is because in some cases, in fact, a lot, for, a lot, for a lot of it, prophets were really more like preachers. In other words, they were given a message from God that was to be communicated to the people of the day. That, that's what they were doing. They were communicating God's revelation, whatever thing they were doing wrong and, and they needed to stop. And, but then we have portions of prophecy where they are prophesying, right? Where they are foretelling future events. I'll tell you the way it was taught to me many, many years ago in Old Testament, talking about the prophets. Here's how my Old Testament professor put it. In some cases, prophets are forth telling or for telling all right sometimes they are forth telling what does that mean sometimes they're just stating the truth you know prophets prophets were like theological 2 by 4s to the face this was their function you there's never there's not one prophet that you read that you think oh oh this is great this is a really touchy feely prophet all right? You never read a prophet and think, he's sweet. This guy seems to be a lot of fun to hang out with. All right? None of the prophets feel that way. All of them are like slugging it out with you. I mean, it is, it is body blow after body blow, then roundhouse. This is what the prophets do. So the, it's, it's not sweet and comforting, you know, Psalm 23. All right? That's not what the prophets are. Sometimes they're just forth telling, but then sometimes they are foretelling, meaning they are pre not predicting. I don't want to use that term. That's why I use the word prophesying, because prophets don't predict. They declare. They declare. They either declare the truth or the truth as it will be. And so they're either forth telling, saying it like it is, or foretelling. All right, so when it comes to that second category, the foretelling part, when they are prophesying, what should we be looking for? Again, three categories. Number one, the first category I would call the immediate application. The immediate application. What does that mean? Well, it means their message applies immediately. In other words, the immediate application, in some cases, the message of the prophet is being applied directly to the people of the prophet's day. 
Kind of what I was just saying. I mean, a lot of the prophets, this is how they're speaking. They are speaking directly to the people of the day. And, and I would then extend that, by the way. I would say some prophecies have an immediate application because here's how it's worded. And I'll give you an example here in the book of Joel. An immediate application is the message of a prophet that's being directed at the people of the day and to their children and to their children's children. All right? So that's, that's, what, we mean, that's what I mean by immediate. It, it has a direct impact on those who are alive at the time that the message is given. So Joel chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. So in my mind, though, it extends for many, many years. This is an immediate application to that particular generation, those in the day of Joel and maybe a subsequent generation or two to follow. So when you're reading through the prophets, then you, you want to ask the question, does this apply to the people of the prophet's day? If so, how? How? And I'll go ahead and tell you, if you ask that question as you read through the prophets, I know this, this, it may not feel this way, and you may have to read the text more than once, all right? We've already talked about that responsibility as a faithful reader to read it over and over again. But I think you'll find yourself plowing through a lot of the prophets way more effectively than you thought you could. So asking the question... How does this apply to the people of Joel's day? So Joel's a good example here. So, so Joel was a prophet in the 800s BC. His prophecy was to Judah, right, the southern kingdom. So we already set up all of that. And so as an example of this kind of application I'm talking about, Joel chapter 1, we're not going to revisit the whole chapter, but Joel chapter 1 de- describes for us a plague of locusts that descended upon the land of Judah. In other words, Joel chapter 1 is an immediate application. It's not symbolic. It's not a metaphor. Nor is it prophesying anything to come years later. Not not in terms of of this, all right? It's going to use it as an illustration in a later chapter, Joel will. But in terms of Joel chapter 1, this this is what it is. we, we, We don't... We don't need to monkey around with it. We don't need to try and find something that's not there. We don't need to make it more confusing. What is Joel talking about when Joel says, uh, there's a locust plague, and so what one set um, eats and leaves, you know, then passes on, then the other set's going to come by, and they're going to eat even more, and then another set's going to come along and eat even more. Pastor, what is he talking about? He's talking about locusts. That's what he's talking about. He's talking directly to the people of his day. They have faced a devastating locust plague. Now, here's what makes Joel chapter 1 then a prophetic pronouncement. This is not a natural occurrence. Joel's first message is to tell the people of his day, this devastation we've just gone through is God's judgment upon you. This is the work of the Lord. This, in fact, is a type of the day of the Lord. So, an immediate application. Right away, we see this is for them. All right, let the, go, go to verses 21 through 27 again of chapter 2, all right? Again, this is, this is, these are verses we were in for a few weeks. And this follows, this follows that the, the, the general promise in verses 18 through 20, now that the people have confessed their sin, they have repented of their sin, they've returned to the Lord, God has heard their prayers, and God says, I'm going to be zealous for your land again, I'm going to pity the people. And then, then he tells them in verse 21, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Then he goes on to tell the beasts of the field, don't be afraid. He goes on to talk about how the, the, the vegetation will produce again. He goes on to talk about how the people will harvest again, and they'll, they'll have wheat on the threshing floor again. And we looked at last week, the second half of that text, where he, where he says, so I'm going to restore the years that were eaten by these locusts, and you're going to have plenty, and you're going to be satisfied. Who's he talking to? There's an immediate application of this text. You should ask yourself the question, does this apply to the people of the day of the prophet? If so, how? Yes. 
Yes, it applies to the day of, to the day of Joel. How so? All that they had lost in the locust plague is going to be returned to them. They're not just going to enjoy good years to come. They're going to enjoy abundance. They're going to enjoy more than they would normally have in a year's time. I think that's what it is promising to them. Now, you may, you may won't ask this question then. How do you know that? How do you know? I mean, given that we're reading a prophet, how, how is it that you know he's, this message at least has application to the people of Joel's day? How do you know it's an immediate application? Because the passage gives me no reason to believe otherwise. Now, this is what we'll, what we'll get to the next week. The passage, though, does give me reason to believe the immediate application is not the only one. But I do believe that the promise that's made here is a promise made to the generation of Joel's day. I believe they experienced all this. I think God blessed them again. And in fact, the phrase that comes up, and this is often what's brought up in regard to this, notice the end of verse 26 and the end of verse 27. My people shall never be put to shame. My people shall never be put to shame. He says it twice. Pastor, I'm pretty sure the Jews were put to shame again. Yes, they were. But not this generation. Not this one. I think, it's a pro- I think that promise applies to them. Now, that phrase, though, my people shall never be put to shame, that does, though, give us an indication, huh, this is, this is not a forever statement, though, about subsequent generations of Jews. There's more here. This passage, for sure, there's just no doubt in my mind, because there's no good exegetical, meaning a study out of the text. There's no good reason to deny this. There's nothing about it. There's nothing about the history. There's nothing else in the Old Testament that would give me an indication that, that God did not do what he said. Furthermore... That phrase in verse 21, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. It's it's English, right? And it's past tense. It's going on. In the language, the way that it's written is saying, yes, this is something that God has started to do. He has started this. This is happening now. The marvelous thing. So I think they got their land back. I think they got their crops back. I, th- I, think, uh, I think everything was productive again. And I think that generation, that generation then enjoyed God's blessing. I don't think they, I don't think they ever experienced God's discipline again. God did not judge this generation again. All right, so this would be the immediate application. There's nothing in the text that leads me to believe otherwise. All right, so next week, though, we're going to have to stop here. Uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to a couple of more then next week. But just to, again, go ahead and, and prime the pump a little bit, that phrase, my people shall never be put to shame, that, that does, though, require us to think carefully. Yes, it does apply, but is there something else going on with this text? In fact, Read the very next verse. Well, you've probably already shut your Bibles. All right, so listen to the next phrase that follows in verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. So already we have some indication. The passage is not only talking about Joel's day, right? Because he says afterward. At some point following, and I always say afterward, but he says, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now, uh, you, you might would have to do, you know, some asking around or some of your own study, but then again, maybe you would already know this intuitively. Can you think of any Old Testament story where God poured out his spirit on all flesh? I can't. Because the answer is no, all right? I'll just go ahead and tell you now. The answer is no. So there's something else going on here. There's something else going on here. Right off the bat, we can tell. All right, so th- this, is what, this is part of how you should read Old Testament prophets. 
you do need to ask, so what is the immediate application? I would, I would encourage you to resist the temptation because here's what I know we love. We love some prophecy, meaning we love end times prophecy. I understand. I understand it's interesting. I understand there's a lot in the Bible about it, and I'm not making light of that, but what I'm, what I'm discouraging you from doing is rushing past the immediate application of the text so you can get to the juicy stuff, right? Uh, so you can get to the later prophecy end time stuff. I'm not saying it's not there because I think it is. I'm just saying it's not all that's there. And Joel, for sure, God, for sure, felt like this was a message the people of his day needed to hear. Why? Well, because some of it applies to them. And, and so we need to make sure that we understand it in its immediate application, uh, and, and I think that, that already gives you, you know, maybe a good head start on understanding these things. All right, let's pray together. Father God, we do thank you for gathering your church tonight. Grateful that we could pray together. Grateful that we could be in your word. And we do want to be faithful students of your word, so continue to, to, to give us Uh, tools and equip us and by your spirit uh, enable us to understand what you have given to us. We want to be faithful to it Uh, and we want more than just knowledge of the head. We want it to get into our hearts. We want it to be expressed in our lives. I thank you for these who've come out tonight. That they've given of their time during the middle of the week to be with God's people, to pray, to be in your word. I pray they would know your blessing that they would know your hand leading and guiding them, that they, would know, that they would be given wisdom for the days to come, that they might live in faithfulness to you. And then we ask, Father, that you gather your people back together again on the Lord's day, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. That's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.